Welcome back to the Sleuth Intuition channel. This is True Crime in the Morning. I'm your host, Patrick Viajos. My friends call me Sleuth. Today we are looking at the missing persons case out of Bloomington, Indiana, Lawrence Spear. Um, this case was in the public eye at one point, uh, but it has the attention has seemed to have uh, fizzled down since. So that is the very reason we will be covering it today on True Crime in the Morning. Now, Lauren, she was born January 17th, 1991. She disappeared June 3rd in 2011. Uh, she was last seen traveling from her apartment a short distance to a, a sports bar nearby called Kilroy's. From there, back to her apartment and then an, a short distance up the street to a friend's apartment. She hasn't been seen since. Uh, they recovered her, I believe, her phone, phone and purse, or phone and shoes um, in the alleyway between her apartment and the place where she was last seen. And we'll get into the details here in just a few minutes. Welcome in, everybody. Good to see you, Metal Mama, Shane, Farmer, or Sensei, Jill. Anything I like, Boston. Hope everybody had a great weekend. Good to see you, Sensei. Thanks a lot, Farmer. I appreciate that. Sponsoring today's live stream. Olivia, Beth, good to see you, Frederica. Miss Thing, how are you? What's up, Ruckus Rocks? Welcome in. Thank you, Farmer. Mustang, how are you? Frank Meister. Bloomington, little college town, young girl just going to school. I mean, they absolutely have no idea what happened to her. And I really don't know if you can trust any of the four guys that she was last seen with. I don't know. They lawyered up pretty quick, so I'll let you guys be the judge on that one. And apparently not a, not a lot of her friends that were with her that night even helped with the search. So they vanished and then they lawyered up. Doesn't mean they're guilty. You know, strategically, it's probably the best move, but I think it still raises some red flags. Uh, Shane, didn't know that was your name i wouldn't have guessed cool though oh what patrick vallejos <laughs> that is my name you can call me patty sleuth whatever pat whatever floats your boat good to see you charlotte horihito welcome in hey robert good morning to you hola what's up sarah Dash, good morning. Wanda from Missouri. It's a cute picture. This is off of uh, the Facebook group their family put together. Kind of get an idea of her character. That's her mom. She obviously takes after her mom, her mama. Security, uh, this is the last image of Lauren. 
And I believe this was caught on security camera at her place, I believe. And this was right when she was leaving. So she went out to the bar and came back to her apartment. This image was taken and then she left from there um, to go up the street to a friend's apartment. And that's when she was last seen trying to make her way home. All right, we're at about the eight minute mark, so we'll get going here in just a few moments. Um, we're going to read one article and then a couple of videos that will help us uh, break down the timeline, talk about some of these uh, persons of interest. We'll take a closer look at um, Kilroy's, a closer look at some of these people that are mentioned, some of the rumors, and... Um, and then we'll spend the last part of the live stream kind of fact checking ourselves. Anybody in the chat wants to correct any of the information that we're getting wrong, feel free to. And we'll open it up for a discussion. So here's Bloomington. Uh, this is kind of a back view of Kilroy's bar. And if you walk directly up this street here, you will end up at Lauren's um, apartment complex, which is you can, it's visible here somewhat and this is the front of the bar and in the background you can see lauren's um, apartment complex you can kind of see it in the background there so obviously she didn't have far to walk college town rumor is there were some drugs circulating with the guys that she was with that night i don't know if um, she dabbled or not Uh, Robert Richburg says, Josh Hallmark of True Crimes. What's BS? Podcast makes a strong case that serial killer Israel Keys murdered Lauren. Be interesting to know how he got to that. So according to uh, witnesses at the bar, Lauren took off her shoes because you can see the sand. You know, probably feels really good between your toes. Gives you that feeling, you know, of being at the beach. I've been to bars like that. So this is the last place she was seen right up the street from her apartment. And to the right here is five North townhomes. Pretty much the last place um, she was known to to be at. And then she, the last person who saw her alive was up on the balcony and witnessed her walking in this direction. So he kind of saw her kind of fade out into the distance right around this area. And he was standing up here somewhere up on a balcony. This is Lake Monroe, just outside of Bloomington. There was rumors that uh, she may have been left here. 
And we'll get into the details of all this as we go along. Monroe Lake or Lake Monroe? Not quite sure. Tomato, tomato. This is Lauren's apartment. So over here you would have <clears throat> Kilroy's sports bar. She would have just walked right around the corner, stopped at her apartment here, and then continued up. Apparently she didn't travel up the street though. We'll take a closer look, but just behind these buildings, um, there's a long alley and that's where her phone was found. Thank you, She Warrior. Yeah, this is a really sad case. And it kills me how they just kind of, um, people just stop, stop talking about it. You know, the parents are still upset as they were day one, yet nobody else cares, right? Life goes on. Human beings have a very short attention span and short term memory. But for the parents, I'm sure they wake up every morning and they just want to know what the hell happened. It's like, it's got to be torturous. Oh, you live in Bloomington, she warrior. Okay, so we're definitely going to be paying some close attention to what you got to say. Uh, let us know about the college atmosphere, <clears throat> the drugs, maybe um, any other similar cases. Because right now on the surface, it appears that um, somebody in the group that she was with that night was a predator. And she looks like an injured animal, right, to a predator. They don't look at us as human beings. She's an injured person who um, nobody can really attest to where, where she's been and where she's going. Maybe they took advantage of her. As I've gone through all of the facts today, that's how it seems to me. Uh, there were rumors about a white truck that was quickly dismissed. We won't really touch on that too much. Uh, people would speculate, oh, it looks like somebody's in the back. Uh, but I guess there was a, some confusion about <clears throat> this vehicle possibly circling, circling the area right where she was last known to be. But really, it was just two cameras that their timing was off. So he never really circled the area, uh, stopped and picked up somebody, I think, that was working in the area. Not sure. Something like that. But it was dismissed. going on Frederica Deborah how are you shout out to Dripping Springs Texas I like Texas what's going on V Marie welcome in okay so let's go ahead and uh, we'll look we're gonna read one article and the only reason we're going to do this article is it kind of sets the tone, the confusion. It's um, She disappeared June 3rd. I believe this one is um, was put out around June 8th, if I'm not mistaken. So, I mean, it's just nothing but confusion at this point. And then we're going to slowly kind of drip the information out. And then um, once we have all of the facts, then we're going to start going over the timelines and the POIs and looking at the maps and trying to figure out what might have happened. And then I'm going to keep my ears open to the chat. Um, some of you who may, may have been following this case much longer than I have. I've touched on it a few years ago. Um, 
while covering the Delphi case and other cases that were surrounding and uh, basically cases out of Indiana and Kentucky. I touched on the case, but we're going to do somewhat of a deep dive here. We'll start with this one here. This one's from CNN by Stephen Laconi, Laconi, Nancy Grace Researcher. This was published June 8th, 2011, titled Police Search Missing Indiana Students Apartment Complex. No, Miss Thing. Police have executed a search warrant at the apartment complex where a missing Indiana University student lives, and authorities acknowledged Wednesday that they are becoming increasingly concerned about her safety. We believe you guys can hear that okay, right? I just want to make sure. Quick sound check. I believe that the chances are very great that there was foul play in the disappearance of 20-year-old Lauren Spear. Bloomington Police Department Lieutenant Bill Parker said at a news conference Wednesday morning. Spear was last seen around 4.30 a.m. Friday walking around from an apartment building at 11th and Morton Streets in Bloomington. A few blocks from her home, after going to a bar with friends the night before, an acquaintance saw her walk toward the intersection of 11th Street and College Avenue but police have said surveillance cameras in the Smallwood Plaza apartment complex where she lives do not show her arriving. Parker said officers were looking for copies of security cameras footage from that night when they broke through the doors at Smallwood Plaza Tuesday. He did not know why they were initially denied access, but he added that Smallwood personnel have been cooperative since. He explained that they obtained the search warrant because private businesses commonly want official paperwork before turning over evidence, and that was perfectly normal. In a statement provided to Bloomington's Herald Times newspaper, a representative for the building's management said that nobody with a key was available on site when police arrived to serve the warrant. Uh, let's go really quickly to this comment here. That's a follow-up. Uh, Hallmark notes that Keys flew into O'Hare that night and immediately rented a car. There were some games he played with toll roads where he really was and then disappears until mid-morning the next day. That's interesting. Have to follow up on that. Thank you. According to the statement, Smallwood Plaza has and will continue to fully support and cooperate with the police investigation and respects the decision to obtain these hard drives as quickly as possible. Parker said police have video of Spear enter entering the apartment complex around 2.40 a.m. on Friday with a friend and then exiting, exiting 10 minutes later. Although she did not go into her own apartment while she was there, they believe she and a friend then walked to the building at 11th and Morton, where other friends lived. Authorities are still examining the recordings, but Parker said, we did not see indications on that video that she was being forced. Police have interviewed many people, including Spears' boyfriend and the friends she went out with that night. She disappeared. They are all also working on conducting polygraph exams. Okay, let's take a look here. Another follow-up. Last thing is, Keys like to sink bodies into deep water lakes. And there was a burner phone with Anchorage Exchange that pinged near 1 at 4 to 5 a.m. that morning, per the FBI. Investigators have obtained some evidence of value, but Parker would not specify what has been collected. While anyone who was with Spear on June 3rd is considered a person of interest, Parker said, we don't have anybody that we can characterize as a suspect. Police and volunteer searches continued Wednesday. Parker said that a representative from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children will assist in coordinating the searches. 
The entire city has been searched at least once at this point, according to Parker. In some areas, particularly those close to Spears' apartment building, have been looked at multiple times. All right. Let's go to this comment from Miss Thang. The consensus, is, it seems, is that drinking and drugging along with her heart condition caused her death and her so-called friends covered it up. Well, there was... um. We're going to touch on that. There was apparently somebody that was arrested in Bloomington that went to school with Lauren and he was all drugged up one night, stripped himself completely naked and started shooting at police. Well, while he was incarcerated, he made a statement and said that that's exactly what happened, that the people that she was with that night, um, something happened and she ended up overdosing and they ended up, I believe his statement was that they took her to the Ohio River or something along those lines. We'll get more details when we get to that point. But yeah, you're right. That could have happened. Police now want to expand the searches beyond the city limits. Although they do not have specific information indicating that Spear was taken out of the city, Spear's father also spoke at Wednesday's news conference and thanking the police and volunteers for all of their assistance. It's critical that we focus on finding Lauren, Robert Spears said, noting that people from their hometown in Westchester County, New York, and others from the county country have come out to help with the searches. It's really hot out there. These people are incredible, he said of the volunteers. ROTC members in particular have been searching some difficult terrain, according to Spear. He again urged anyone with information related to his daughter's to his daughter to contact authorities, consisting that nothing is too small, nothing is too insignificant. Lauren Spear is described as four foot eleven and approximately ninety-five pounds, with blonde hair and blue eyes. When she disappeared, she was wearing black stretch pants, a tank top, a loose light colored shirt, and no shoes. Robert Spear provided two numbers that people can call with tips the Bloomington Police Department at 812-339-4477 and a tip line set up by America's Most Wanted at 800-CRIME-TV. All information can be provided anonymously. See, and that's the part that I really don't get. If it was her friends or somebody that took advantage of her that night, why don't they just say, hey, call in anonymously? Nobody will even know. Just say, hey, this is where she's at. This is where we put her. You know, go buy a burner phone, drive across state lines, make the call, leave the burner phone, and drive home. It will take you, take a small amount of energy to relieve those who cared about Lauren from years of pain and agony. Think about the power of that. Right now, like the guilt is eating at you. Just let it go. Nobody will even know it was you. So they had the search warrant for Lauren's place. Couldn't get in. Couldn't get anybody to open the key, uh, to bring a key and open the door for them. So they just kicked in the door. To me, I felt like they were more worried about the security footage. You know, they don't know. Maybe the security guard working at that facility had something to do with it. All they have to do is get in there and delete all the footage, right? They weren't going to take that chance. So I really appreciated that part of it. They kicked in the doors. They didn't wait. And they went and took that footage. Uh, she warrior says tons of drugs and parties here. I bet. Like I said, it's a college town, right? Uh, 
Uh, Daniel Messel was arrested for killing of another IU student, Hannah Wilson. They looked into him as well. He used to cruise the area at night where Lauren went missing. I didn't see that one. We're going to talk about a couple of POIs outside of um, her group of friends. I guess they served a search warrant on uh, a local sex offender as well. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you. Good to see you, Candace. Cindy, how you doing? Um, the young men she was interacting with that night definitely know, in my opinion. That's that's where I'm at right now. I mean, I can't say for certain, but the way the story plays out, um, the guy that she went to the bar with, apparently they were pre-gaming. They were all they were all messed up already. Went to the bar, got more messed up, and then came back to Lauren's place. I don't know why. I don't know if she wanted to pick up a jacket. Maybe she was picking up, uh, I don't know, maybe something that she, you know, they want, maybe some drugs. Who knows? But she went back to her place, and from what they know, she never even went into her apartment. So maybe she was picking up something from um, a neighbor that she knows has stuff, right? You know, we were all young at one point. We know how that goes, right? Doesn't mean you're some kind of drug addict because you're having because um, you want to party that night. But unfortunately, sometimes that could end up being your last night, especially when you don't, when you kind of lose control like that. But anyway, this guy that she was with, what was his name? I think it was Corey Rossman. And we'll get into the details here in a little bit, but apparently some college kids kicked his ass because it looked like he was getting ready to take advantage of her. Early on in the media, they didn't talk about it that way. They said, oh, Lauren was with a friend and he got into a fight, so Lauren had to help him home. But that's not the picture that I'm seeing now, going over all of this information. It was almost as if he had to carry her. She was the one stumbling. And even to the point where some guys were like, hey, man, you need to leave this, this girl alone. And she was already home. And there is some footage, apparently, of... Lauren over this guy's back he's holding on to her almost like fireman style and he's leaned over and her feet are off the ground and he's just kind of carrying her I'm sure that could be harmless I don't know the relationship but they tried to paint this picture that Lauren was being helpful and her her buddy was the victim and she helped him and then on her way home something tragic happened to her I just don't think that that's true There is a tenor of distress in a mother's appeal, an IU student who seemingly vanished. The picture of the pretty co-ed now taped to age-old trees. We're going to go up Hickory Ridge and do the same thing we did the last time. Her father, Robert. We'd like anyone who's seen her to please contact the Bloomington police immediately. Dad and mom flew in from New York Saturday, still stunned by the news. The search spans a massive expanse. They're searching here because they say they were told to. And police? They're focusing their search in the city of Bloomington. Lauren was likely out partying, last seen walking south on Bloomington's College Avenue from 11th, her apartment on 8th in college, just three blocks. Video shows she never arrived. How long are you all planning to stay out here to search? I don't know. A long pause from Dad. Lauren! Lauren! As the echoes of Mom's plea bounce about the four right so when you're searching you're hoping that you're going to hear a, a faint scream in the distance and when you arrive you know your family member is there with a broken ankle saying thank god you're here you know i'm so thirsty and i'm so hungry and i'm so cold you know that's your uh, best case scenario, really, in these situations. And I'm sure that's what the families are hoping for. We hear that time and time again. But investigators definitely do not believe that's what, what happened. Yeah. 
Uh, Miss Thing says, I think the crazy dude with the gun was debunked. Yeah, I wonder why he was saying those things. I think he's out of prison now. Uh, Miss Thang says Lauren's boyfriend left campus a couple days after she went missing. Is that the wolf guy? Jesse Wolf. Okay, this one's about five minutes long. Looks like Fox News put it out. Friend of student Lauren Spear has no memory of the night. So this character that got into a fight and apparently these other college boys didn't like the fact that he was with her. You know, I think it was like around, it was pretty late at night, anywhere between two and three, I think. And they had a problem with it. And all of us, Guys know how it was being young, being at the bar and watching that happen. So we know, you know, it happens all the time. Guys get their ass kicked trying to sneak a drunk girl out of the bar or um, kind of latching on to somebody who's had too much to drink. Oh, I'll take care of them. You know, come with me or just try to slide out. That happens uh, more often than people think, especially um, in these little college towns and in the bar scene. So you got to be very careful. Uh people roofing your drinks lacing uh maybe marijuana or something like that but yeah it happens often Indiana College student tells police he has memory loss from the night she disappeared. Lauren Spearer was last seen June 3rd after a night out with friends. Now a new report reveals two hours before she vanished, Spearer helped a male friend get home after he'd been in a scuffle. And that friend now claims he was punched in the face and has no memory of how the night ended. Well, meanwhile, police and Spearer's mother are pleading with the public to call in with any information they might have. I think that we were all very hopeful uh, that there would be that one nugget of information or that one phone call that would come in uh, that would lead us to Lauren. Um, and at this point, that phone call uh, has not been received, uh, but we are uh, still uh, encouraged. In relationship to that, the person that knows this person that's not coming forward with the information, I beg you to come forward. Well, joining us now is Fox News contributor Rod Wheeler, a former D.C. homicide investigator. Thanks for being with us, Rod. Good morning. A quick check of the timeline. Thursday night, she goes to Kilroy Sports Bar. 2.30 in the right. morning, she leaves with Corey Rossman. Ten minutes later, arrives at her apartment building with him. There's a scuffle caught on tape between Corey and another man in that lobby. And so Corey and Lauren left, never went up to her apartment. They go to Corey's building nearby. They visit multiple apartments in that building. At about 4.30, Corey's roommate, Mike Betts, says Corey goes to bed, Lauren leaves. She's last seen walking barefoot on the street three blocks from her apartment. Surveillance video does not show her arriving at her own building. Her keys, her coin purse found in an alley on the way home. Obviously something happened during that walk home. Foul play, do you believe? I believe it was foul play, but I can tell you that the police are operating right now off of three theories real quickly here, uh, Patty Ann. One, you know, is Lauren's disappearance the result of the altercation that took place that you just talked about with these other individuals? The police have not ruled that out completely yet. They have identified 10 persons of interest that were involved in that, but so far none of these people have panned out. The second theory that they're working off of is maybe Lauren was the victim of some sexual predator in that community. Now, there's well over 140 sexual predators living in that community there in Bloomington. So they are checking that out. As a matter of fact, the I just read where the U.S. Marshal Service has gotten involved in this case. And they're looking at these sexual predators. And then the third theory real quickly is whether or not Lauren just could have walked away, maybe harmed herself, and she could be somewhere waiting on help to come. So one of those theories, I think the police are going to really, really zero in on this week. Yeah. Uh, Corey Rossman, this person who she was walking back and forth with, has hired a lawyer immediately. Uh, right. And the lawyer says that when Corey and Lauren arrived at that building, that there was that fight, Corey was punched in the face. And the lawyer claims that now Corey has no memory of anything else that happened that night. Fishy? You know, we call that convenient amnesia convenient. in law enforcement. You know, <laughs> why convenient. is it? Here's my question, Patty Ann. Why did this guy run out so quickly and lawyer up? 
typically as a homicide investigator or any investigator, when a person runs out quickly right after somebody is missing or harmed and get, a, and get an attorney, we always look at that person with some air of suspicion because that's a little bit unusual. Now, that doesn't necessarily in and of itself mean that Corey was involved, but it does raise the level of suspicion with him. And then why is it that he cannot remember something that just happened days ago? Well, if you're out drinking and you you you're almost blackout drunk and then you get into a fight, I don't know if you guys have ever been in a fight, but you can literally get punched in the head and lose memories forever. <laughs> so go talk to a boxer and ask him about memory loss and things that just disappear. So that does happen. People in car accidents, head injuries, um, or even just drinking that night, you know, you're just out of it. So I can see how he could have memory loss. I just didn't like the fact that the story he painted was, oh yeah, some guys kicked my ass and um, Lauren was helping me home. But no, he, those guys kicked his ass for a reason and they thought Lauren was in trouble. So, and also when it comes to the drug, drug use, it makes me wonder why they were stopping. Why did they um, take a pit stop? And also maybe what the witnesses are telling us is not even true. None of it is true. You know, they could have targeted her from the beginning, and this is just the account that they're giving us. Yeah, um, police are not giving details on who is or is not cooperating, but they do say, as you mentioned, there are 10 persons of interest. They say one of them is Corey. One of them is Corey's roommate, Mike Beth. Right. Another one is this other person who says he saw her leave the building. Also, uh, she has a boyfriend, Jesse Wolf, who That's she right. apparently was not with that night. Uh, they say that some of these people have not agreed yet to be interviewed by police and that police cannot compel them to come in and cooperate at this point. You know, Patty, and I find that to be the most interesting aspect so far of this case. Let me tell you why real quickly. Thank the you, police Shane. chief made a statement yesterday, and I thought this was so interesting. He said to the people there that we cannot compel people to stay in town. If they want to leave town, they, can, they have the right to leave town. I'm thinking to myself, why did he make that statement? It's almost like he's saying there is someone or maybe a couple of people who have left the area. They have not cooperated. They have used the polygraph exam on certain people. But so far, like I said, that has not panned out. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, you've got the Texas Equisearch talking about getting involved, and they say they're hoping for a miracle, but in their own words, it doesn't look good at this point. Uh, one of the focuses was this Lake Monroe nearby. That's right. Police yep. apparently got some kind of, they call, very specific tip, but Lake so far Monroe. that hasn't panned out. What? Uh, how, how does that play into this? Well, I can tell you that they got so far about 40 tips. I don't know if you know, but America's Most Wanted ran a segment Saturday night on right. this, and as a result of that segment, they got 40 tips in. You know, the normal course for an investigation like this is to check every tip out, see if it pans out. So far, nothing has panned out. But any information the police can get right now is definitely going to be helpful. So if any of our viewers know anything about what could have happened to Lauren, they really need to give the cops a call there in Bloomington. Uh, let's go to this comment here by Miss Thang. Lauren also fell and hit her head. That's why she was carrying her over his shoulder. Yeah, and I don't know if that happened before or after, but we are going to touch on that. There was a witness that said um, her and I believe it was Corey were sitting on a, some steps. Corey was below her and Lauren was sitting on the steps above and kind of leaned forward and lost her balance and smacked her head so hard on the concrete that it could be heard some, some feet away. So that should give you an idea how uh, inebriated she was or drugged who knows uh, Mustangs asking when was this well Lauren went missing June 3rd 2011 Uh, good to see you, GP, Brad, V, anybody else coming in late? Good to see you guys. Uh, Frederica says, Corey will never talk about it. I don't think he will. This Rosen Rosenbaum guy, too. I think he was the last person to see her alive. I think he should be at the top of the uh, per people of interest. 
Uh, Sensei, I just can't understand how people can stay silent and see the parents suffer. Yeah, it's difficult to see that. Not having any answers or closure makes my heart hurt for these many victims and families. That's why I do true crime, because I can't do that. I think I would fall apart. And we all act like we would do this and do that. Um, we talked to a victim's father, Jeff Buzziak, and you know he, he kind of set the record straight about how it really is. Like, yeah, you'll say, oh, well, I'll kill the son of a bitch, or um, I'll do this, I'll do that. But the truth is, you really don't know what to do. It's pure torture. Anonymous, uh, anonymously uh, is to be received through either the Bloomington Police Department or through the America's Most Wanted uh, tip line. There will be no taping, so you can feel free to give us anything that you know, and if it leads to us finding Lauren, you'll get the reward. And with so many national organizations assisting now, can you just share with us where the, the money is, is coming from for the reward? Uh, I won't say specifically, but we've been uh, overwhelmed with offers to provide financial support, either in connection with the reward or in connection with a fund that we have set up uh, to help find Lauren for expenses and things of that nature. Of course. Yeah. And you all have been here for, for several days. Yes. How, how long are you going to stay here in Bloomington? As long as it takes. Okay. Um, with the, the surveillance tape, have you all actually gotten to see that yet? No, no. we've not seen any video. Do you feel like the, the police department has been very communicative with you and just kind of keeping the lines open and, and telling you and updating you on things? We, uh, we meet with the police every, every morning. Day. And we have a briefing with them yes so and then after the briefing we uh we have a news uh, you know we make a statement and so do they and the police department has been wonderful they've given us you know numbers phone numbers encouraged us to call them anytime day or night with um, any questions or concerns or you know they've been extremely open um, to communicating with us how have your evenings been after the, the 5.30 search? What are your evenings Jesse. like? Jesse. We generally... Um, They're working evenings. Yeah. Right. We often have like another um, media obligation. We usually regroup with sort of our team of friends and family to review everything, go, everything, go over everything, kind of strategize for the next day. And um, so it's sort of like the beginning of, a, of our next shift. She's like, we don't ever stop. We just do something different. It's, it's torture. Uh, let's go to She Warrior 64. I had to step away a second. Do you know that Lauren had a heart condition? Are you asking um, if I verified that she has a heart condition? Or are you asking that I'm aware of that? I have read it. I don't know if it's true or not. In one of the articles I read, um, it was stated that she had a heart condition. It's not really like after the search ends at 5.30, um, we're done. It's, it's really more the beginning of our next shift. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us that, that we should know about Lauren? Well, we ask again that if you have information, uh, anything small could be big. Please speak up and help us find Lauren. Uh, we can't thank the people of Bloomington enough uh, it's just every day is a, is another wave of support from people. Uh, and I can tell you that out of town as well. All yeah, that it, from people from out of town are coming in, friends and family, they just keep arriving and uh, they're here to help us and they're extremely helpful. And, uh, we're, we're just so thrilled that everyone is reaching out to us. Uh, I can tell you that as parents and, and going through this, um, the support of people helps us, makes us stronger. So uh, we really feed off of that. That could possibly be. Any, any if idea? you hear somebody, you know, just an offhanded comment, um, if you, oh yeah, I saw Lauren on Thursday night at like three o'clock or, you know, anything really, anything. I saw a strange truck on the, 
in, out of on College Avenue. I, you know, it could be anything that yeah. appeared out of the ordinary, or even if it didn't, just reflect back and think about what you saw that morning, or even any time during the evening that might help us. So, th this is to some extent a puzzle, and you take these pieces of information and you put them together and you evaluate it uh, to try to develop leads and. It's it's that's why it's so important for us to have these pieces of information. Have you had the opportunity to speak to any of our friends? Good point, Shane. That is a great point. Uh, we've had the opportunity to interact with her. Some of her friends are here. Uh, many of them have gone back home for the summer. Uh, but yes, we've spoken to her friends. Okay, because I think you've alluded to this, but the most important thing people can do, because I know everybody in Bloomington just wants to help. Right. How can they help you the most? One thing I would say is to continue to come out and help us with the search because we need the numbers. It's, I mean, we've come to see Lauren numerous times, but it's usually just been right on the IU campus. And what we have discovered is that there are massive areas of land and property and mountains and lakes that we had no idea. I mean, you know, somebody, we, live in a community that has very little property. So when we come here and somebody has 150,000 acres, it's just, you know, so it, Thank you, we Daisy. just beg everybody to keep coming out and keep volunteering. And it has made tremendous difference uh, in our efforts. So um, if people could keep, keep coming and helping us and we, we are not giving up and, you know, we have a lot of faith. turning into a master investigator. Uh, let's welcome in Saska. Hope you're feeling better, Saska Rose. Welcome in. Uh, good to see you, Jamie. Hope you're feeling better. Think you're down with a broken arm. That's crazy. I hope you have a quick recovery. CJK, welcome in. He passed out. Rosenbaum, I thought. We're going to work out those details. I think uh, Corey Rossman is the one that passed out. But I could be confused. I thought he threw up and then was walked upstairs by Rosenbaum. And then Rosenbaum tried to tell Lauren, hey, you're drunk, just you know, sleep on the couch. And she was kind of giving him a hard time, like, no, I want to go home. I need my phone. And his neighbor apparently knew Lauren much better. And he tried to kind of get her to go over there or call him and get her to come, get him to come take her over there. But that didn't work. And she was kind of saying, I just, I'm just going to go home. Now, I can have these names mixed up. But either way, we'll clear it up here shortly. Uh, v. Marie, constantly grieving for your loved ones. I mean, just imagine waking up and then pretty much spending the majority of your day thinking about it, thinking about it before you go to bed, probably having nightmares. I, I don't think I could handle it. Yeah, I see all the pain, Shane, and I just feel like I would turn into a monster myself. Like I would just have so much animosity and I would lose my faith, I think. I'm just not sure. Like you just don't know. And I don't want to know. Uh, Jamie, my arm is much better, guys. I have surgeons that did John Cena's elbow. Damn. Surgery, so I'm in good hands. Well, that means your arm's going to be like locked up. You're going to be going like this. You're going to, in the middle of the night, you're going to hear noises. <laughs> that damn John Cena song. Uh, since I wonder what happens to these people who have kept such secrets. Whether when they get older 
and get things like dementia, whether things get said and dismissed as their illness. While we were working with a um, cold case detective, detect, uh, retired, of course, Detective Corbett, and he actually solved a cold case out of South Bend, Indiana, with a similar situation, you know, loyalties had changed. Um, one of the killers had passed away and was no longer terrorizing his wife and children. So the wife, now elderly, um, was willing to come forward and explain exactly what had happened. And they were able to close the case on that book or on that, close the book on that case. Sorry. I mean, it is possible, Jamie, you know, middle of the morning, early morning hours, like 4 a.m., I think, probably the only person on the street. I don't know. I think one of those boys had something to do with what happened to her. Just taking in everything into consideration, he seemed very determined to get her back to his place after not being successful there but I could be way off. I'm definitely not trying to accuse anybody. One hundred percent, Shane. All right, let's keep it going here because of time. We're at the one hour mark. TV six that ABC News investigation into the disappearance of Lauren Spear. We may finally be on the verge of answers in the five year long mystery, one that's gripped Indiana and really the entire nation. You're going to see it all in an extraordinary 2020 tonight. Now just three hours away. ABC's Brian Ross and Brad Garrett spent the past year digging into old clues in Lauren's disappearance and uncovering new leads as well. One of them tracking down a former classmate of Lauren's who says he knows the people who did this. We're also getting our first look at part of that special tonight. Also in the mix, a flood of tips about the alleged involvement of current and former members of Biker Gang. What's up, Boston? The Sons of Silence, so brutal. They were featured in this History Channel documentary as a new kind of mafia. Oh, gosh. This reminded me of what was going on with the Delphi case so much. Uh, what was the name of this biker group? Sons of Silence, right? What's the other one? Sons of Odin or whatever in Indiana? Featured in this History Channel documentary as a new kind of mafia. Did you shoot her? No, I didn't shoot her. You didn't shoot her? I don't even know the broad. I told you that. Bye. And then in the last few months, Garrett received a set of brand new leads from inside a state prison, claiming that some of her fellow students saw Lauren die and secretly disposed of her body. She OD'd. They got scared and drove her down to the Ohio River and disposed of her body. Let's bring in Brian Ross, chief investigative correspondent for ABC News. Brian, thank you so much for joining us today. Good to be here. What intrigued you about Lauren's case before you began to investigate? The fact that nobody seemed to be able to come forward and say what happened in that pivotal last few minutes uh, on June 3rd, 2011. She appeared to have just vanished off the face of the earth, and we know that couldn't have happened. No body and no significant leads. So former FBI agent Brad Garrett, now an ABC News consultant, about a year ago, took on the case. He joined with private detectives that the Spear family had hired and began to go over the leads that had been dismissed uh, by Bloomington police and developed new fascinating details and theories what can we look forward to seeing this evening i think you're going to see some of the leads that garrett has taken on and in some cases have been able to dismiss in other cases been able to bolster and now advance he has been all over uh indianapolis all over bloomington uh, we brought in polygraph experts to give people a lie detector test a lot has happened in this case hey, well, and he feels the momentum now is on his side and that in fact the time is on his side because people change and as he gets farther and farther away from the time of the crime more people may be prepared to come forward and finally reveal what they know happened to Lawrence Spear. ABC News Chief Investigative Correspondent Brian Ross, thank you so much for your time. We'll all look forward to watching this evening. Thanks for having me. Most students on the IU Bloomington campus when Lauren disappeared have graduated, but many still know the story and still hope for a break in this case. rtv 6s Chris Prophet in Bloomington now with the hope for justice for Lauren.
It's been over five years since Lauren Spear vanished from the IU campus after a night out with friends. And while the years have gone by with the crime unsolved, her presence here is still felt, along with many of the same questions. Just find out who, like, what happened to her, like the real story. You just hear different stories all the time about what happened, like one thing, and you hear something else. Like, just get into, like the real story, and if some if someone was involved in it, like getting them arrested. After Lauren's disappearance in June of 2011, her face was on billboards and flyers across campus in Bloomington. And something that troubles me, and I can't kind of get this idea out of my mind, is if if these boys that were with her had something to do with it, the reason that they're not going to say where she is is because they know that the DNA, their DNA will lead to their arrest. I think that's why they're not talking about it because they know if she is found, they're going to find key evidence that will lead to one of these uh, persons of interest. Now her photo was hard to find. Life moves on, but whatever happened to her still hangs over this campus. It's been so long that I think that a lot of people have lo lost hope just with everything that they've done. Bloomington police say that the case is open and active, yet there have been no arrests. Her body never recovered Good old Tim. as if she vanished. Rabbi Sue Silberberg, executive director of IU's Helene G. Simon Hillel Center, knew Lauren and remains close to her parents. She spoke by phone while traveling on Friday. It definitely has changed my life. I've not been the same since then because I think about, I think about Lauren every day and I think about her family every day. Students say that Lauren's disappearance has made them more aware of their own personal safety. Well, I was like younger at the time, so like I just like really like showed us like you have to be careful like going out and like I don't know like who you're surrounding yourself with and like what you're doing. The hope is that the ABC 2020 investigation will offer new information that will lead to an arrest and also Lauren's remains. Uh, BH says uh, these parents were from New York. I believe they were from Scarsdale, New York. Because Lauren graduated from Edgemont High School in 2009. Yeah, she's just going to school there. She was going to school at Indiana University. Bloomington is a college town. Good to see you, Leslie. How are you? Okay, now we're going to start kind of diving into the timeline. In every state, really, Willow. Willow said so many college missing persons cases in Indiana. I mean, it's, it's terrifying. It's hard to wrap your mind around it, really. It's almost like your mind won't allow it. <laughs> you know, you start diving into it and it's like, nope, too scary. We're going to go back this way. It's trying to protect you from what is really going on, you know. The truth is sometimes hard to swallow. In Ohio, 10 years captive. That's interesting. You should email me about that, BH. Okay, so they talked a little bit in some of those reports about Lake Monroe. And I think they even said the Ohio River. So let's take a look. Is it Lake Monroe or Monroe Lake? I can't remember. Online, they have it both ways, so it's confusing. It's a nice looking lake, pretty big. Uh, CJK, good to see you. her purse and keys. Okay, yeah, her purse and keys. That's what it was. I think she left her phone and shoes at the bar. Thank you, CJK. So her purse and keys were found in an alley. I'm surprised they weren't some kind of cameras there. 
No, there are. Like they have a whole lot of CCTV footage that they're not releasing. And then they also mentioned the Ohio River. So it looks like that's about a two hour drive. Got Bloomington. There's Monroe. So it's almost like on the way out in that direction. But the closest point to the Ohio River is here in Madison. It's a two hour drive. Uh, Miss Thang says the bikers were debunked also. Yeah, that reminded me a lot of this Odinus, Odinism theory over on the Delphi case, right? Be very easy to pin it on those guys. Uh, Saska is asking, and this is a great question. Can we get some verification on that? What kind of heart condition does she have? Anybody know? Because through the remainder of the live stream, I don't think any of the information that we're going to present will give us that answer. Now, this is kind of like a timeline map that I grabbed online. I can't remember where I found it, but it was very helpful. So Lauren lives here. Kilroy's bar right up right around the corner. And five North Townhomes is the last place she was spotted right here. Now there's an alleyway right here and we'll take a closer look when we pull up all the other maps and we'll go to Google Maps too. But apparently what was it, her keys? Her purse and keys were found here. And I believe her phone was left at the bar. Yeah, the Ohio River. But what's really strange is they may there may be some truth to it, right? They may be getting only half of the story. So maybe she did OD or maybe she was killed after a sexual assault. It always sounds better to say the victim OD'd, right? Then than I did something bad. So it was her fault. And we just panicked. So that's the half truth. It was most likely a sexual assault and then a murder to hide the fact. And we can come back to this towards the end. Now, this video is a little bit, these last few videos are on the um, long side. This one's 15 minutes long. It's been more than 10 years since the disappearance of IU student Lauren Spearer. The 20-year-old sophomore vanished after a night out with friends in Bloomington back in 2011. The Bloomington Police Department has said that Spearer's case remains active and they say they have received more than 36,000 tips since Lauren disappeared. Now, of those 1,100 were described as actionable tips and some led to search warrants. Let's look back now at the timeline of events back in 2011 when Lauren was last seen in the early morning of Friday, June 3rd. Beginning that weekend, volunteer search parties are formed to find the missing 20-year-old sophomore. And on June 6th, her parents, Robert and Charlene, speak to the media for the first time, pleading for help in finding their daughter. 
somebody knows something. And I would just beg and plead that that person come, you know, however they want to get us that information. I don't care if it's the website, you have a friend, you can call the friend, you know, I, I don't care. But somebody knows where Lauren is. Somebody knows. June 7th, police released specific details of what happened in the hours leading to Lauren's disappearance, that she spent time in a Bloomington bar, walked back to her apartment, then to a friend's apartment. Her friends report she was last seen leaving that apartment to walk home. That night, police used a battering ram to burst into a room in the lobby of her apartment building to get surveillance video. We don't have anybody that we characterize. I really like that. I really like the fact that they didn't hesitate on that. You know, somebody, they basically said, hey, we can't get you the key. The person who has the key we, we're not, is not able to get there. You know, we can't assist you right now. <clears throat> and they said, well, hell with that. We have the search warrant. We don't need the key. You know, imagine them waiting and then come to find out the following day there's some video that's been um, deleted. And uh, one of their security guards is suddenly he quits his job. You know, there's going to be this uh, cloud of what if. So I'm glad they did that. They knew how important it was to get their hands on that security footage. And I think they were hoping that they were going to get a lot more from it. Rise as a suspect. But we do have, you know, people that were with her, of course, are persons of interest. June 8th. Police acting on a tip to search Lake Monroe. They did not find anything. On June 9th, police reveal at least 10 persons of interest, including Corey Rossman. His attorney says his client is cooperating. There's also an announcement of a reward for $100,000 for information that leads to Lauren. Accompanied by his attorney, Corey Rossman, one of the 10 persons of interest in the disappearance of Lauren Spear, left the Bloomington Police Department after reportedly giving a DNA sample. I just hope that they find her as soon as possible, and I'm praying for her and her family. Do you have anything to do with her disappearance? Absolutely not. That's all you say. So he has nothing to hide. That's why you can't. No, we're, we're, we continue to cooperate, and we'll cooperate. There are the search guidelines. There's a number for the detective on top. We're asking people to report anything sure. big or small. After a week of looking, the search continues. Hundreds of volunteers and police scouring Bloomington and beyond looking for any sign of Lauren. Kristen Green drove three hours from Valparaiso. I don't even know the girl. I don't know the family. I mean, my heart goes out to them, but I want to help the stay, help the community. Friday morning, police set up a roadblock. I agree, route, Frederica. And at the same time, Lauren was last seen. Officers stopped more than 100 cars handing out flyers and asking for any tips. Unfortunately, at this point, uh, that didn't provide any result. Uh, so uh, we may be looking at doing that again. Detectives can. Uh, let's go to Boston Christian's comment real quick. So Israel Keys was in Indiana, too, they think. Well, I'm just I know I heard a little bit about that before. We're, we kind of touched on that. And I'm going to look a little bit more into that. I'm not sure a whole lot about that theory. But from what we're hearing, yes. Firm that Lauren's boyfriend, Jesse Wolf, a fellow IU student, is also considered one of the 10 persons of interest in the case. Do you believe her boyfriend was with her at any point during that night or the early morning hours? Uh, that's uh, information that I just don't want to go into the specifics of that yet. But police say Wolf and all of the other persons of interest have cooperated. Later on June 14th, police released pictures of a truck caught on surveillance camera in an air uh, caricature good to see you or says or one of them is the culprit and the other three didn't know that's what it kind of seems like if what they're saying is true uh, this Corey character who got his ass kicked for appearing to be taking advantage of an intoxicated person ends up throwing up and uh, being laid down by his roommate like Come with me, buddy. You know, you're not feeling well. Let me help you uh, here. Take off your shoes. I'll see you in the morning. You know, you could tell me all about it in the morning. Well, now comes back downstairs and there's Lauren still drunk. He's like, well, what do I do? Well, Lauren, you can stay here. Well, for all we know, he took advantage of her. We don't know what happened from that point. So in my mind, this dude is probably the most suspicious 
because he's the same witness who is the last person to see her alive walking towards that intersection area where she disappeared and a picture of Lauren leaving her apartment that night. The owner of the truck, one of the first and only leads revealed in the case, would come forward a couple days later and be cleared. I think if you look closely at the content in this picture, you will see who Lauren is. For the first time since this investigation began, more than a description, a picture taken the night before Lauren Spear disappeared. Happy smiling, beautiful young lady on her way out for the evening to meet with friends. The 20 year old Indiana University student after a night out with friends never made it home to her Smallwood apartment, disappearing about 4.30 a.m. Friday, June 3rd. After nearly two weeks of extensive searches, police offer a new clue. The photo of a pickup truck taken from security camera video that this will yeah they debunked uh, all this shed some light on uh, somebody who may have seen something in that particular area at that time the truck a white Ford yeah one of the worst with writing on the side and what appears to be equipment in the back was captured on video driving around the block about the same time and place lauren spear disappeared it could either be significant to us in that that person may have some direct responsibility for the event or that individual has information that could lead us in a direction. The photo of the truck, investigators hope, will spark new leads in a case now in its 13th day. The photo of Lauren for her family, a reminder to whomever is responsible of the urgency to bring her home. To the person or persons that have Lauren, uh, we miss her terribly. Uh, she's uh, very dear to us. We love her very much. Uh, yeah, let's go to Miss Thanks comment here. You would think her boyfriend would at least have spoken public publicly at some point. Yeah, because you always have that factor. Okay, the roommate's telling the truth. He tried to get Lauren to sleep over. That didn't work. Tried to um, pawn her off, so to speak, right? Um, on another friend of hers that was the neighbor of this roommate. That didn't work. So she insists, I'm going home. I'm going to go find my stuff and then I'm going to, I'm going to walk myself home. I'm not staying here. So maybe that is true. And then she did make some calls. So maybe the boyfriend does show up after the fact, pissed off, jealous. June 15th, volunteer search efforts continue to mount. Hundreds of people turn out to look for any sign of Lauren in and around Bloomington. Not saying specifically that it would have anything to do with it. June 16th, police release a specific timeline of times and places Lauren was seen the night before she disappeared. Her parents talk exclusively with 13 News. Their hands intertwined, their faces not able to hide the exhaustion. Robert and Charlene Spearer have a mission and a message, ever focused on finding their daughter. 20-year-old Lauren disappeared in Bloomington two weeks ago. Despite daily searches with hundreds of volunteers, the Spearers say they're frustrated that someone who knows something has yet to speak up. It's mind-boggling how somebody wouldn't come forward. It's just not within my realm of thinking, you know. and or Lauren's for that matter. You know, I know without a doubt that if Lauren was able to help somebody, she would. So it's just beyond us to think that somebody is withholding critical information. Put yourself and your family in our position and think. Uh, CJK says, right, phone left and found at bar by the boyfriend. Is that who found it? I don't remember hearing that. That'd be very strange if that's what happened. Would you want someone to come forward to provide information that would help find somebody who's lost? There have been signs of hope, surveillance pictures of Lauren, a detailed map of her movements that night, and a truck that apparently circled the block when she was last seen. Having somebody there at the spot at about the right time might have really significant information that could help with the search. The search itself is now beyond Bloomington, helped along by experts in the field. Many times, Lauren's parents are there searching too. They also meet daily with detectives, give interviews, That's what I hear, and keep BH. track of the case on social media. It all takes energy and emotion. How do you get through this day in and day out 
and sustain that strength that you both display so well? I have one thing in my focus and that's Lauren's face. And that is what keeps me going is, is, you know, my complete total focus and purpose and determination is for Lauren. For the ones ensuring the job always gets. I'd like to thank all of the people that have had the courage and the compassion to provide tips in connection with Lauren's disappearance. Meantime, another plea from Lauren's father. Let me ask those that have information about Lauren or the events of that evening to get the courage to come forward and tell us good point, Farmer. anything that you it's know. A good point. Information Robert Spear would consider a gift. We all know that this Sunday is Father's Day. This is hard to watch. I would ask any of the uh, children out there to uh, let your parents know. A father who can hardly speak when he considers Father's Day fast approaching with still no word about what happened Jeez. to his daughter Lauren or where she is. June 19th, police search a rural area in Morgan County after reports of a suspicious odor nothing is found. What are you waiting for? June 22nd, Charlene Spears says she's disappointed only one of Lauren's friends come forward on their own to police. The parents also open a P.O. box for tips. June 25th, find Lauren Day in Bloomington. Hundreds of volunteers take part in massive search efforts. Rob Spear has been at it since early Saturday morning, just like he has been every morning the past three weeks. His life has a single mission, find his youngest daughter, Lauren. He sat down exclusively with Eyewitness News to talk about the search. I think it goes without saying, every day we wake up hoping that that will be the day that we find her. So yes, I do want something to happen. Uh, I desperately want something to happen. This is a white truck, I believe. And he is not alone. There have Frederica, been thousands truck. of volunteers searching for Lauren in every corner of Bloomington. And another 500 plus volunteers were in town for Find Lauren Day in what could be the last big search to find her. We haven't quite figured out how we'll stay uh, connected to the community, but people are always coming up to us asking if they can help. As for Lauren's friends, at least those that are believed to have seen her last, none of whom have helped look. Well, they're not here. Jesus. They've gone home. Uh, many of them finished their classes. They might have had some summer classes, so they've gone home. They're not they're not around to help search. Some of those friends might have been with Lauren in the minutes or hours before she disappeared. Did any of them show up in the 300 hours of surveillance video that police say they have reviewed? I don't think it's necessary for us to see all of the tapes. They've described to us what's on some of the tapes. Rob Spear and his wife Charlene are briefed by the Bloomington Police Department every day on the progress of the investigation. As you would expect, the search for their daughter has become their life. Our hope is that It'll happen today. That's the way we look at life. Let's, let's hope that today is the day. June 27th, person of interest, Jason Rosenbaum's attorney says he's cooperating with police and passed a polygraph. On June 28th, police say they're scaling back searches, shifting the focus from daily foot searches to following leads as they get them. And then on the 29th, the command center on campus for volunteers closes as daily volunteer searches end. Police search the townhouse she was last seen leaving. On June 30th, Spear's parents attend a public prayer service held at a Bloomington church. You really get to know the fabric of a community, uh, often by the difficult times that it experiences collectively. Uh, we're uh, forever grateful for everything that everyone has done and the support that's been given to us. We're now at July 1st. Her parents call a news conference. They say they plan to stay in Bloomington and appeal once again for someone to come forward. Uh, four weeks ago today, I received a call that Lauren was missing. Since June 3rd, Lauren's parents have led the search effort, personally meeting with volunteers who scoured the Bloomington area and beyond, but have been unable to find the missing 20-year-old.
we're full of Lauren in our hearts and we're motivated very strongly to continue searching for her. In the past, they've said they were disappointed with Lauren's friends, only one of whom came forward with information. Today, Robert Spear appealed directly to those friends' parents that they need to speak with their children. Help them find their moral compass. They need your guidance and your strength to do the right thing. Wednesday night, Bloomington police detectives and canine officers searched the apartment building where Lauren was last seen. Two friends she visited there remained persons of interest in the case, but police have not commented about what, if anything, was found. Lauren's parents seem convinced their daughter's friends know more than they're telling police. To the person that has knowledge about Lauren's whereabouts, if you think that our determination is any less, it's not. If you think that our hope and our belief that we're gonna find Lauren has changed from day one, it has not changed. We are just as determined today as we were day one. So what I'm hoping is their determination is equal to the guilt that the perpetrators are feeling. And I'm hoping that their guilt doesn't subside, but actually increases over time the same as the pain does for the family. And hopefully that'll break these folks. And really, it's simple. They can lay down the guilt. They just have to say something. You can put it down and walk away from it. There might be some repercussions, but that's all part of the fear and the guilt, right? You got to let it go. You have to face it. Uh, Shane says, yeah, the cops were proactive quickly. Yeah, I'm, I was pleased by that. And it sounds like this uh, Jason Rosenbaum character passed a polygraph, according to this report. Um, and here's a guy that I looked into briefly. His name is Justin Wagers. Apparently, he's a sex offender. And they served a search warrant on him. I don't have a whole lot on this angle, but I figured I'd share it with you. Chaos divers. Um, yeah, they need everything. Honestly, the country needs an army that is just dedicated to finding missing people. Like, that's where I want my tax money to go. You obviously can't spend it on preventing these types of crimes. At least um, use my money to help folks with a little bit of relief. By at least knowing, having some kind of answer. What's up, Christine? Uh, Miss Thing, there was much talk back then about the fumbling police and the college as not to make the school look bad. Yeah, it's kind of reminiscent of the Idaho murders happening there in Moscow, another college town. Uh, BH says there was a white truck they were looking at when Lauren went missing. Yeah, we touched on that for a bit. Uh, that's been uh, cleared. I think I have some of those photos here. So apparently, so they had two different cameras pick up this white truck and the timestamps were off by like five minutes or something like that. So law enforcement thought this person in the white truck was circling the area. And this is right up the street from where Lauren went missing. And then they had this footage where you can't really tell what the hell this is back here. Kind of looks like there might be a person in the back holding another person. But the truth is, um, they never circled. That was just a mistake, right? So there's all these little things you have to consider the variables, right? when you're looking or trying to do your own investigation. But yeah, it was cleared. This person apparently was picking up somebody or worked in the area and was picking up a coworker or picking up somebody that worked right here. They have since been cleared.
Yeah, that goes uh, for a lot of these sickos, like the BTK killer. Miss thing. We looked at that truck pick back then and swore we saw a person in the back. Yeah, I remember that. Let me pull that back up. You know, it's kind of like the bridge guy images. Right? Look at the pareidolia. Look, it's a face. It's a giant head. <laughs> the killer is a giant. Look at his big fat leg. Some obese savage. Being driven around in a pickup, taking people. <laughs> Giving, flipping the bird, apparently. Sideways. With uh, spiky hair. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Oh, on the side of the truck, yeah. Hey, what's up, Lila? My daughter lived in a dorm at IU, 2020 to 2022. People were always drunk or high in her building. I mean, that's, unfortunately, that's a college life. Um, we saw from covering uh, the Idaho 4 case, you know, with Koberger and people who got the dash cam footage from law enforcement who were answering 911 calls for noise complaints. And I mean, these people were partying at all hours of the night. The party didn't stop. And if it did, they would just walk across the street to another party that was going on. A party in which the residents or the owners of the home weren't even there the majority of the time. Uh, Levi Fletcher, welcome in. I live 30 minutes south, and I always thought she would be found in one of the hundreds of quarries in the area and surrounding counties that are pretty easy to access. Some are anyways. I don't know. Maybe that, that's where people local to the area should go search. I mean, if you were leaving Bloomington and you were wanting to come back, that's your home. You're not just passing through. Where would you leave to try to hide somebody and then come back? Where are some of those places? Uh, Frederica, in response to Levi's comment, says some of those quarries are bottomless. Yikes. Yeah, me too, Sensei. If you know me, is asking, can you do the treehouse murder in Key West? I'm down here. Dude is being his own lawyer. Is he doing pissing you guys off down there? Treehouse murder. Got another Ted Bundy wannabe over here. I'll take a look. Key West, huh? Shoot me an email, sleuthintuition at gmail, if you want to send me some details. Or point me in a good place to get started. Uh, CJK, these cases are incredibly sad. Parents and families who should be living life with their missing and murdered loved ones, celebrating birthdays and babies and holidays breaks my heart. I hope she is found. Yeah, it's it takes their life really 
away from them because now they're just that's all they're doing they're just dedicated to finding out what happened to their loved ones their life is gone too it's not it's not that their life is gone and they have a new life it's awful Take care, Mustang. Thanks for uh, all your input in the chat today. Appreciate you. Okay, let's take a look at Justin Wagers. So apparently they served a couple search warrants on this now guy. searching two properties related to missing IU student Lauren Spear. She vanished from campus more than four years ago. FBI agents and cadaver dogs spent the day at a property in Trafalgar in Johnson County. And yesterday, they and federal investigators spent hours at the Martinsville home of a man now in jail on unrelated charges. Eyewitness News reporter Emily Longnecker is at the Johnson County Jail tonight where police are holding that man. Emily? Well, John at Nam, that man is 35-year-old Justin Wagers, and as you said, he is here in the Johnson County Jail where he has been since last August, and that's when police say Wagers exposed himself to a woman at a local Circle K, but that was just one incident, they say, in a long line of it's similar disgusting. cases where Wagers has actually pled guilty to the same kind of behavior, and for the past 24 hours, places where Wagers has lived or visited have been the focus of intense scrutiny by the feds. Justin Wager's father and grandfather aren't denying Wagers has had legal problems in the past, but say they can't imagine he had anything to do with Lauren Spears' disappearance. Something, though, brought the FBI and other law enforcement to their property yesterday in Trafalgar with cadaver dogs. Wager's father took eyewitness news through his property this morning, telling us the FBI spent several hours searching the grounds and trailer, but does not believe they found anything. Wager's grandfather, Frank, also weighed in. Well, I don't think that's in him. I don't think that he had anything to do with nothing like that. <laughs> I don't. I just don't believe he did. I, they uh, it just don't uh, just don't don't fit him. I mean, he was just too good a boy. To... That good what? boy, though, has been a registered <sighs> sex offender since 2007. Denial. According to court records, Wagers has criminal convictions in five counties dating back to 2000. Wagers has pled guilty to 10 counts of public indecency, four battery charges, two charges of vicarious sexual gratification, one charge of intimidation, and one count of invasion of privacy. Blood boil. Wagers ex-wife got a protective order against him in 2011 after police records show he repeatedly showed up at her home, got physical with her, and threatened to sneak in her home and kill her. Wagers attorney maintains his client <sighs> has nothing to do with Spears' disappearance. Good one, Shane. Bloomington police, which is heading up the investigation, is remaining tight-lipped about any developments. I can't release anything other than what the deputy chief has already released in the press release um, that uh, we did, in fact, uh, assist the FBI in Morgan County as part of an ongoing investigation to the Lawrence Spear case. Bloomington police and the FBI spent the day yesterday at the home of Wager's mother and stepfather on Old Morgantown Road. They also brought in cadaver dogs, sifted through dirt from a barn on the property, and hauled away a white truck belonging to wagers, which law enforcement sources tell Eyewitness News will be tested for DNA. Those same sources also tell us they found no human remains in their search of the Martinsville property. Lauren Spears' mother, Charlene Spears, says she wants to find her daughter more than anything in the whole wide world. So could this latest investigation bring the Spear family the answers they've been longing for for the past four and a half years? Investigators just aren't saying yet. And Marie? Yeah, certainly are. So, I mean, they really have nothing. Um, this is going to be, I wanted to finish with this one. We may not have enough time to go to the maps, but hopefully we do. Uh, but this one breaks it down. This breaks down everything, the conspiracies, um, all the fine details, um, location. Um, all, hold on. All the location information. This is we're going to finish with this. And I want this. I want to go ahead and uh, start our discussion based on the information we're about to watch right here. And while we're discussing, then we'll look at the maps and look at these uh 
I guess it's about four different guys that they're calling uh, persons of interest. Of Smallwood Plaza, where she lives, uh, shortly after midnight, she went up the street with David Roan um, to Jay Rosenbaum's apartment. Uh, he lives in a, in a townhouse complex. About 10 people were gathered inside his apartment um, drinking. So, um, Jay said that uh, a lot of the, the hard alcohol was already gone, that he had uh, six to 10 shots of Belvedere vodka, uh, but they still had a keg of beer going. Um, we know that there were, were some drugs in use. Um, at the party or, or um, shortly beforehand. Um, this is a, a gathering that goes on almost weekly. Uh, they call it pre-gaming. And um, at a certain point, about 1.30 in the morning, um, people headed out. Lauren Spear went two doors down to Corey Rossman's place, and uh, the two of them went to Kilroy's together. A few of the others who were at the pre-game also uh, showed up um, at the bar. Lauren uh, took off her shoes, left her cell phone, um, walking around on the, the sandy uh, sandy lot that they have there to create kind of a beach effect. Um, so we know that there was some more drinking going on at the bar. Um, Corey Rossman and Lauren left together. They headed back to Smallwood Plaza, where Lauren lives, uh, went up to the fifth floor. In the hallway, they were confronted by four guys. Uh, who came up and saw that Lauren was uh, was in bad shape. Um, one of them asked uh, Lauren if she was okay, and Corey said, uh, you know, I got it. Uh, she's fine. And uh, does he say? And I'm, then he, then the boy again says, hey, dude, you better take her to a room. Same boy. See, got and his ass kicked. Corey now gets mouthy. See, that seems very suspicious to me. These uh, young boys thought that she was in danger at this point, to the point where they physically harmed the man that she was with and said, fuck you, I got it, and that's about enough for Zach Oaks. He's a tough kid, I hear. And uh, one punch to the, to, the, to the jaw, and Corey went down. I think so, this is in the alcove of the elevator, where his tile floor, not rug. So he went down maybe kind of hard. Corey and, and Lauren took the elevator down to the lobby, and um, Lauren came stumbling out of the the elevator. So Corey was the one who got punched, but Lauren was the one who is, uh, at least uh, in the video, um, who needed all the help. Um, Boots on the was, ground, uh, Brad. One thing that seemed to contradict um, the version that's given by uh, Corey Rossman and his lawyer. Um, Corey claims uh, he suffered um, uh, short amnesia, uh, that he doesn't even remember what happened, um, that 15 minutes Half before truth. The, the fight, the punch, um, and for the rest of the evening, he has no memory of that. So they, they headed out together. They walked up the street and uh, sat down along the way on a staircase. And that's where we have a female witness who was leaving. Thank you, Sensei. Uh, visiting a boy. She's not a college student. She's a little bit older. And she, she observed the young girl, which we now know to be Lord, to tip over. Thank you, guys. Sitting on the top step and hit her head on a concrete. And the boy was sitting a step or two below her. And it was loud enough for her to hit. You could hear the thud. Of the thud of her head, yeah. So Lauren and Corey um, headed up an alleyway from there, and uh, Lauren is uh, seen uh, falling face first uh, to the ground, um, hitting her head. Um, she didn't even put Not up sure, her hands Daisy. block herself. Um, Corey helped her to her feet, and then just a few steps later, she uh, crumbles again to the, the ground. Um, and again, Corey helps her up and they head up the street. So Lauren and Corey, um, headed up an alleyway no. from there and, um, head into, uh, an apartment building at 10th and college, um, knock on the door of, uh, four girls, um, who were partying with them earlier in the night. Um, but no one's home. A minute later, the door opening and them going back down and him helping her with that kind of slung across his back. Right, so down going down the stairs, right. going down, he slings her, he puts her. He has her arms on like it. this in front of him, and, and he's bent over like this, and she's kind of dangling off his back. Right. She's but she's, she's, than him, so she's she moving, is. though, she's not unconscious. No, she's oh, no, she was, was, she was alive and well. I mean, I don't know how well, but she was alive. She has another uh, seat, sits down, and... Uh, for about a minute, 
Um, but at that point, she, she leaves her keys, she drops her keys um, and uh, an ID card. And uh, Corey helped her up the street to his apartment. Um, once they got inside his apartment, my, his roommate was inside, Mike Beth, who was home studying, and he, he had also done uh, some drinking. Um, Mike Beth um, sees Lauren in the living room. He sees his roommate, Corey, uh, walking up Mike the steps. Mike Beth, and not he, Rosenbaum. And, uh, Sorry, Corey guys. throws up on the, on the carpet, and uh, Mike Beth goes over and helps him uh, up to his bedroom. This is what Mike Beth said. So Mike Beth is the guy who seems a little suspicious to me. And he might be the one who was um, seen her alive, the last person to see her alive. Um, after putting uh, Corey uh, to his room, he comes down, he sees Lauren uh, in the living room, and uh, obviously she's in bad shape. And uh, Mike Beth tries to get her to, to sleep over there. And Lauren wanted to go. So with that, Mike Beth said, I don't know her as well as Jay Rosenbaum knows, so he knows her much better. They went to camp together. Right. In uh, Pennsylvania. Right. So he walks her next door, and he makes her uh, Jay Rosenbaum's problem. And uh, Jay is trying to get her to sleep over there. She oh, okay. Have it. Um, she... So I was right. Jay Rosenbaum is the last person to have seen her. Okay. That was the confusing part right there. And that's why it's important that we, we play this. So this is great reporting here. She wants to get her cell phone. Um, she wants to leave. And uh, at about 4.15 a.m., um, we learned that uh, two calls were placed from Jay's phone. And uh, uh, the claim is that um, she made both calls calling uh, two friends, um, one of them, David Roan, um, because she thought that he had uh, her cell phone. Um, neither of the friends answered the phone, um, and that's when uh, Lauren left. That he watched her from his second floor balcony. And the balcony, if you passed his house, is about a foot and a half wide. See it right there? fit a chair out there. But you could stand out there and smoke a cigarette, I guess. Uh, let's go to this comment real quick. Hey, Linda, uh, Linda, welcome in. Who is Israel Keys? He's a convicted serial killer. And apparently he was uh, in Indiana or near Bloomington around the time she went missing. Has anybody thought about being sex trafficked? That could be a case. I mean, if she was unhealthy and kind of appearing as if um, she needed help, somebody could have came and snatched her up. But I mean, being in a college town, the guys that she was with getting their asses kicked for dragging around this girl instead of taking her home, right? She was at her apartment. The, what they should have done was taken her to her room and laid her down there and maybe even stayed in the living room or called somebody, but they shouldn't have been dragging her around. You know, she couldn't even walk. So yeah, anybody could have snatched her, but I have a feeling that one of these folks, one of these uh, guys that she came in contact with knows what happened to her. And that's just on the surface. That doesn't mean that's what, what happened. Of course, we always know if you're going to find any answers in an investigation, you have to scratch the surface, right? We want to get through that layer. So we're going to go ahead and just call it as we see it. And right now, that's all we have is what's on the surface. And it, that's the way it appears to me is that one of those gentlemen has information. And and I believe the reason that there hasn't been any kind of an anonymous tip, because everybody that know anybody that knows, knows that wherever she is, is in that very location, they're going to find the killer's DNA. I don't think they want that. So I think what's going to crack this case open is going to be a good tip. Um, the killer saying something to somebody that they shouldn't have, somebody overhearing it, uh, maybe a strange suspicion from a family member. Just tip that in. I mean, you never know. You never know. And he said he watched it from there. So he could see her walking down the street. You saw that's the vantage point? That's, that's according to him, yes. 
and he says not all well, cj gets to the court. you know he said he was able to see her almost until she got to the court. the private investigators say that there were a lot of conflicting statements that night and and uh they're they're not sure whether to attribute it only to the fact that maybe they were drinking they were doing drugs uh, or to the fact that they're withholding information they're not they don't really have their story straight okay so that's going to do it for all of the videos that we have um i do have a reddit timeline that i wanted to show you guys but we are out of time it was by the bones of autumn so you definitely want to go check that out. I think we're going to finish up on um, taking a closer look at the area here. Okay, I think I'm in the right place. Yep, there's Kilroy's. Uh, it looks like they changed the name of it. Looks like they're calling it... Maybe not. I'm not quite sure. But she lived here. And Kilroy's is just up the street here, right here. So she would have went in this direction. Cut back through here. And went through this alleyway. And I think her keys and her purse were found right here somewhere. And then right at the end of the alley is five North townhomes. And when she was leaving this location, she was walking in this direction was never seen again. So she kind of disappeared from view right around this area here, most likely the tree maybe. Or just making her way around the corner. So there's the alleyway there. And there's the balcony. So he's standing on the balcony, I believe, smoking a cigarette. And she begins walking in this direction.
I wonder why she didn't cut back through here. Maybe she didn't feel safe. She says, I'm going to go this way. That way I'm just on the main sidewalk with the street lights. It's a pretty, looks like a pretty busy street right here. Maybe she stumbled somewhere right here near the street and a predator just happened to be driving by at the very moment. Yeah, she should have never left that place. All rumor. Thank you, V. I'm going to look into it. I think I have looked into that before, but still very interesting. Uh, Levi Fletcher always found it funny that Zach Oates was the boyfriend's fraternity brother. You would think Zach would go get or at least call and inform him some dude is about to take advantage of Lauren. Yeah, and maybe he did. Maybe her boyfriend showed up and was pissed off. Finds her phone, kind of sees, finds some weird text messages or something and becomes extremely angry. But there's no information that he even came back to the scene. So right now on the surface, the last person to see her is this Rosenbaum character. Right? And if somebody just throws Lauren on his lap, he's like, oh, well, I'm here alone with this person. She doesn't even know who I am. She's completely out of her mind. He could have done something really bad and panicked. Maybe she came too and there was a struggle and he strangled her or something. You know, maybe she started sobering up right in the middle of being attacked or um, some kind of a sexual assault. This is her place here. Yeah, it looks like they changed the name. It's kind of a long walk when you can't even stand up. And here's Kilroy's very close. Newman. Hello, Newman. <clears throat> Jerry.
Frederica says, so sad. I moved up this way to get away from crime. And then we had to deal with Delphi and the Odins, the Odinites. I wouldn't panic just yet. Well, yeah, because it's a wor a wormhole. <laughs> You're time traveling. Okay, so this is the gentleman, Corey Hammersley. He went to school with uh, Lauren, and he's the guy that had a bad reaction and got really high. Stripped naked and um, started shooting at law enforcement there. I think he ended up getting charged with like a 20-year sentence. He's free now. I believe he was released recently. But while incarcerated, he said that Lauren OD'd and the people that she was with that night panicked and dumped her in the Ohio River. There was also a rumor that similar to that, but instead of the Ohio River, it was uh, Lake Monroe. So Corey Rossman, this is the gentleman that she was walking with and that got beat up by those boys when they went back to her place. And then from there, they went uh, to Fifth North Townhomes, and that was the last place she was seen. David Ron, Jason Rosenbaum, and Jesse Wolf, the boyfriend at the time. Yeah, it used to be called Smallwood Plaza, where Lauren stayed. Looks like they changed the name. All right, guys. Unfortunately, I do have some more information, but I am out of time. I hear some quick photos I thought were funny of that guy. Apparently, this is him when he's naked and shooting at cops. Hammersley. Crazy. So it used to be called the Smallwood Plaza. The answers to what happened to Lauren are all right in a small area. Apparently they got CCTV footage all through here. They're not releasing it, but they are describing a majority of it. June 2nd. At the party, Rosenbaum neighbor Corey Rossman asks Spear to join him at Kilroy Sports Bar. So maybe that upset Wolf. Jesse. Spear appears extremely intoxicated. 2. June 3rd at 1.46 a.m. Video shows Spear entering Kilroy's. Court documents say Rossman brought her several drinks. Spira leaves the bar with Rossman at 227. So he's getting her all liquored up. Bar closes, what, around 2? So maybe she was just trying to go home. Walk me home. You know, I live just right around the corner. Maybe she had no intention of going and messing around over here. 
To me, it makes much more sense. I'm leaving here. I'm going home, dude. It's almost 3 in the morning. 2.30 a.m. Spear and Rossman enter Smallwood Plaza. Video shows them leaving at 2.42. So this image here is that video here. Let me pull it up. Now, apparently, it's not just Lauren in this video. It's also Corey. So she's leaving her place. She seems to be walking fine now, smiling. But apparently in this video, she's stumbling. Okay. So where were we? Three. Leaving at 242. That's that photo. And then four. Here's that alleyway I was showing you guys. Spear enters alley. Video shows her leaving alley at 2.51 a.m. So they got all this video. Maybe it's time for them to release a lot of that, maybe. Her purse and keys are later found right here. So I believe it's this alley right here. Purse and keys are recovered right down here somewhere. Five. At 3.30 a.m., Rossman's roommate, Mike Beth, finds Spear and Rossman at the apartment. Beth invites Spear to sleep on the couch. Later, he takes her to Ross Rosenbaum's apartment. 4.30 a.m., Spear reportedly leaves apartment alone. That is the last time anybody ever saw her. Creepy Corey. Linda says, I don't believe she ever left that townhome. Mentioned earlier that she wasn't seen on any cameras at that time of morning. Yeah, it's strange that everything else is captured on camera, right? Her coming and going. But her leaving, nothing. I just don't understand how you're going to get a body out of here without getting caught unless it was right away. In this little back road, maybe. Looks like there's a few parking spots right here. Yeah, I guess you could easily right here. Go out the back way. If that's what happened, I wonder if anybody over here saw anything strange. Hmm. All right, guys, unfortunately, I'm out of time. Um, if you guys have any information on this case, the tip line is in the description. And I mean, nothing, no tip is too small. Uh, 
Uh, I want to give an extra shout out to Farmer, Shane, Daisy, and Sensei for sponsoring today's live stream. Thank you so much. Um, definitely a lot more we could have covered and a lot more that needs to be covered in this case. But most importantly, um, if you are a content creator, if you could uh, get her name out there, if you guys could share this video um, and just put her face somewhere, I mean, that's the least we can do. Just keep her face and her name out there. Because if you can continue to put this pressure, if people are feeling that guilt, you never know what's going to be um, the straw that breaks the camel's back, right? And that's what we're doing. We're just putting a little bit of pressure. We're just dropping a couple pieces of straw and hoping that it snaps something loose. That's it. All right. And if you are part of the replay crew or if you have anything you want to add, um, go ahead and drop it in the comment section. I'll be monitoring that throughout the week, and I promise I'll get back to you. If you're not subscribed, consider subscribing. If you are subscribed, consider becoming a member. And um, the rest of you guys, the Sleuth Crew, I'll catch you again real soon. I am out of time, unfortunately. I got to go. I got to take care of a few things. But thanks again for everybody who helped get all these facts straight here in Lauren's case. And... Um, Hopefully her family can get some justice, at the very least some answers. You guys take care.